Hello and welcome to another episode of Renaissance Botany. In this episode, we'll talk about the paper Experiencing the Past, the Archaeology of Some Renaissance Gardens. This paper I'm referencing is by Dr. Brian Dix. The goal of this paper is to understand the original methods and techniques utilized in the creation of ancient Renaissance gardens using archaeology, historic maps, and several other methods, with the goal of being able to restore or recreate similar styles of landscapes in the modern day. Renaissance gardens are typically featured as simple linked arrangements of borders and banks. However, there's a lot more to that. Many of these aspects of the Renaissance garden were aimed to impress and showcase a specific skill or idea within each garden. So the topography and landscape physiology that that landscape architect in ancient times would have used will also play a role in explaining the process behind both the creation of this landscape garden and the thought process behind it. And here are the results of that study. Most gardens within the Renaissance era were developed by landscape architects and artists of that time. Although subject to the manipulation of their patrons, the artist's personal interpretation and designs remain more or less intact from schematics to final product. Manipulation of topography to improve the garden has also been used. For instance, in the 16th century, small amounts of the forest began to be incorporated into the garden itself to be complemented with the ornamental gardens and specific buildings. Topography also acts as a constraining aspect. One commentary mentioned that the war courses at the Valley of France garden is flowing in the wrong direction. However, based on the topography, this is the only direction it could possibly flow in. The garden at Valery, France has a local topography determined by the scope of the garden. It was designed to impress the majority of visitors who never got entry into it as well, and to the delight of those who did. As such, this specific garden was built to resemble a castle or a stage set, as well as be similar to a more exclusive garden in Kensworth Castle. Both utilized love poetry within the design and thought process behind these gardens, using scenes depicted in such poetry to create a base of which the garden should be made in the image of. The gardens of Holden by were designed by architects to induce envy as well as manipulating the topography to create the image of an ideal countryside, even though it was fully designed and operated by an individual. The Liveden Garden was created by architects who designed the garden with a series of ascents and carefully laid out a garden path that represents a depiction of a sinner walking towards redemption. Other gardens, such as the one at Kirby Hall, was meant to be seen from the upper windows of the house, but was further altered when it became the fashion to invite people over to look at the garden. This type of garden was unique and very experimental, showcasing the creativity utilized during the Renaissance era. The garden entirely was made out of grass, with no flower beds whatsoever, relying on the shapes that the lawns were cut into to create the look and feel that the gardener was looking for. Privy Garden, however, was a completely different system, which relied almost entirely on flowers. It was recently recreated as of the writing of this paper. But back to the garden at Valerie. The garden was created to turn the entire surrounding area of a medieval castle into an expansive garden setting. This was a residence for Jacques de Alban, as well as Marechal de Saint-Dierre, as well as a spot that King Henry II dwelt. That's spelled H-E-N-R-I, not H-E-N-R-Y. This garden was created by the artist Pierre Lescott. Modern archaeological studies were carried out between 1995 to 1998 on behalf of the French government to begin preliminary restoration of that ancient garden. The earliest known writing about this garden occurs in 1554-1558, which refer to the construction and filling up with twin pavilions at each end of a connecting gallery that divide the main pleasure ground from the other garden areas. 
This information was recorded by Jacques Antoinette de Coutu for eventual publication in 1578, the first, the first volume of his book, Les Plus Excellent Specimens de France. This design also boasted a substantial dam separating the gardens from the reservoir, or artificial lake upstream, where now dwells a field and a country lane. The dam, however, remains largely intact and still stands to a height of almost 5 meters, and is 20 meters thick. Its construction alongside a series of supporting canals allowed the use of this new device to make inhospitable ground hospitable. Initially, this landmass was damp and marshy and frequently underwater, based on pollen and plant remnants. But after the creation of the dam, dry conditions followed. And from there, that dam allowed for water to be carried through the main garden, indicating that that dam location was once a swamp that was repurposed to be a water source. The central water course was flanked by narrower channels with ground in between, as well as being flanked by double rows of trees that were known to be alders, which thrive in damp sites. A similar phenomenon happened with another part of the design for a planting that took place in the inner banks of the two streams. Further examination revealed that the garden and the dam were both being created at the same time. The filler material was made by dumping material at the side of a clay core, with the mass being held together by several strong outer walls. The wall facing the lake was built with a slight batter to withstand pressure, and the walls were made from sandstone to make it look shiny when looked upon from a distance. The wall itself was built upon a timber spreader plate, which was above a series of wooden piles, which had been driven into the marsh proper. This created a stable footing for the wall to rest on. Access into the pleasure garden proper was made via a century placed twin staircase, which is connected by the canal proper. The staircase was flanked by various ornamental plots with trees planted at the corners. Each component was laid out with geometric patterns that are symmetrical in themselves, although no two are identical. It appears that this entryway has 16 rectangles in total. The walls of the garden enclosure originally formed a 120 meters by 110 meters rectangle, although in modern times it's been modified to provide a new entrance at the modern street level. Several pavilions have been found at the access points in the garden, which were, until modern days, the only access points available. These access points were ornamental alcoves that presumably once contained gates. The sides of the garden were decorated with blind arcading and the open arches of a gallery. Archaeological evidence also indicates evidence of a terrace that was about two feet high, which in later years was filled with soil. This created a need for a series of stairs to move down to the canal. A pair of ramps can be seen near the dam as well, which may have been intended to be used by waterfowl. The slope of the walls surrounding the ramps were also designed to create an illusion of greater length when viewed above the dam. There's also fish ponds that are surrounded with white sandstone, which due to its shiny texture would accentuate the look of the garden. Now onto another garden, such as the Garden of Kenworth Castle. This Renaissance garden was made in 1575 in the heart of England. The garden was created by Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester. The Earl of Leicester was a big fan of Greek mythology, and the entire landscape serves as a feeder to depict different narratives. He had already owned several parks, such as the Deer Park and Mere Park, both of which were vast pleasure grounds, and all were used as scenes of pageantry and spectacle. Outside of the gatehouse, to make the garden complete, the gatehouse was remodeled to resemble that of an ancient Greek gatehouse. A recently built lodging was refurbished for the queen's use, and below a 12th century great tower, or keep, the garden was laid out. The keep itself was partially remodeled to accommodate a picture and viewing gallery. In contrast with the public spaces within that castle, the garden provided a very private spot filled with different narratives, sights, scents, and sounds. This is a place where the Earl and his wife spend a fair amount of time, if you catch my meaning. 
The garden was filled with flowers, fragrant herbs, fruit trees, made to enchant and seduce the onlooker. And within the garden itself, several different statues depicting different scenes of Ovid's metamorphosis were built. Although the initial schematics and the writings remain intact, all the remains of the original garden is the foundation. Remnants of the foundation for a main fountain sculpture was dug up in the excavation, which contained small pieces of Kara marble. The lack of firm foundations for the arbors and obelisks and other features which the writer described suggest that these materials were only of light construction made out of wood and planted to make them look like stone. This makes sense since the stone for making obelisks would have been almost impossible to find within 16th century England. It is plausible that this may have just been built briefly to impress the queen, to give it an illusion of extravagance beyond what the Earl was capable of making, due to the fact that the garden's construction precedes a visit from the Queen. There are still three more gardens to cover, but that will be for next week's episode. Stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching this video. If you're watching on YouTube, please subscribe to me on BitChute for a greater variety of content, four videos a week. And thank you to all my subscribers on both platforms. I appreciate it.